Hey, what's up, everybody? Gonna do a classic rock reaction, and also, this is a birthday tribute. A birthday tribute to Jimmy Page, the great Jimmy Page. He's 78 years old today. Happy birthday to you, sir. So, man, uh, this is what I've got. Got a whole bunch of different things, man, uh, being shot at me. And apologies to a lot of you who uh, uh, whose recommendations I can't uh, put in here. So, um, I've got uh, from Susan Palmer, SPP, a plants tribute to Jimmy, it says, and it's only like two minutes. And then uh, Jimmy Page on Letterman, and that's um, by uh, Tina Curtis. Thank you, Tina. And Evelyn says, here is a link to a radio interview with Jimmy Page in November on the 50th anniversary of the release of Zeppelin IV, in case you haven't seen it. And Evelyn says, uh, Jimmy will turn 78 on January 9th, I believe. And holy shite, I'll turn 75 on the 16th. <laughs> well, happy birthday in advance to you, Evelyn. 75 years young. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, Evelyn, thank you also for uh, sending me a submission for my new channel, RCU. Um, I just cut that this morning, and so that's going to be out maybe an hour or so after this um, reaction, okay? So check that out on the new channel. Thank you for that. And then she goes on to say, uh, Happy New Year, Wayne. You're a true gentleman, and you keep your promises. Well, thank you, Evelyn. I certainly do. I appreciate that. What Evelyn is referring to is uh, I promised her no matter what, I will do the O2 Arena uh, concert celebration day, you know, during the Christmas season, you know, because I was sitting on it for an entire year. And so I made sure that nothing was in my way to doing that reaction. I even took some time off work. I told the girlfriend to hit the bricks for a while. And yeah, it was just me, that little space in time doing that. That was hallowed ground for me. So yes, that's what she's referring to. Um, and then also, so that was the interview. And then Murray Wilkinson, he sent me... Um, Oh, well, let me read his note. Wayne, I heard you say one of your favorite page solos was No Quarter in 73. This was yesterday during the uh, Jonesy interview. This is one of my favorite page solos. Maybe you can play it on his birthday tomorrow. Peace. Also, Happy New Year. Thank you, Murray. Happy New Year to you. Yeah, okay, let's do that, man. Um, so I got, what, one, two, three, four things. And let's do a succession, uh, a back-to-back. -back. And um, another thing I've got to remember to do, I don't do it often enough these days, is I'm going to read a, just a short little maybe two-paragraph bio of Jimmy Page, introducing Jimmy Page. What I've been learning is I actually have a number of young subscribers or subscribers who aren't very well versed in uh, classic rock. So we take for granted who Jimmy Page is, but a lot of people might not know. So I'm going to give him the official bio read, okay? Just so you know. All right. With that said, man, let's check out all these different versions showcasing the man known as Jimmy Page starting with uh, Robert's tribute to Jimmy Page. Let's get it. Your vision and resolve knows no boundaries, extending beyond the music, inspired and propelled by the great ones. Everything and anything has been probable and often possible in your work, always free from the chains of repetition and mediocrity. The challenge for me was how to complement your whirlwind contrasts, so many radical twists and turns with such colorful complementary construction, always pushing the limits from comfort of the bosom to the naked raw edge. You dug deep and deeper, driven by emotion, art and literature, towards the one light of invention and excitement. Mm. On the first day we met, I realized the breadth of influence. The ideas we exchanged were vast, from William Blake to Skip James, 
from Kaleidoscope to Christina Rossetti, from Otis Rush to Dylan Thomas. To make music inspired by these influences, you created music from beyond music. Our travels through India, Thailand and Morocco in the early 70s brought shared experiences mirrored in some of the most illuminating and intensively inventive guitar performances of our genre. Your delivery and poise mirrored and extended the visceral experiences from the physical to the musical form. The limitless creations you shared with John Paul and Bonzo remain unequaled. I was always amazed that I could find lyric and melody to complement the roaring Achilles' last stand or the caressingly beautiful muse that is the rain song. Just examples of the contrasts we experienced. The terrain, often bleak, sometimes remote and sometimes immersed in love, has been spectacular. Best wishes to you and congratulations tonight. Wow. Thank you. Thank well you very said, much. Uh, I know Robert why Plant. people watch this show. Yeah. More Led Zeppelin. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Our next guest, one of the world's uh, great guitar players and a founding member of Led Zeppelin. A new book entitled Jimmy Page. He is also behind the recent reissue of two seminal albums, Led Zeppelin IV and Houses of the Holy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the program, Jimmy Page. <laughs> It always amazes me that such a nice, gentle-looking man is behind so much thunder. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. You look good. Mild, you meek, soft-spoken, but you put a guitar in his hands. Nice to have you here. Thank you. I think this is uh, this this book. I think is uh, delightful because, well, for one thing, it's irresistible. You're you're drawn to it because you know it's rock and roll, and then you start yeah. looking through it, and you can't stop looking through these photos. How did you go about collecting this quantity of photos from your career? Well, I had a lot of photographs from the very early stages, like the pre-Beatles stage and uh, they were like in the family archives and my own archives from when I was a kid and then I had various photographs along the way like when I w went to a cottage in Wales called Bron Ra with Robert Plant and we did some writing and I had photographs from there and it, basically I had these points of reference right. all the way through and I was very keen to do an autobiography in photographs because when other people do a, 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 a biography or autobiography, I always look to see what the pictures you are. You go right put to in. the pictures. I, I do. do the same I thing. Do. I thumb right yeah. through it and I say, oh, yeah. cool pictures. Yes. Yeah, so many times it will contain pictures you have not seen before, yeah. unpublished photos, yeah. and they're quite evocative. Now, is yeah. some of these pictures you took, some of these pictures. The, the there, is, there, took? Is a, there is a selfie in it. <laughs> <laughs> there is. From about, 19, about 1970, the selfie. Uh, yeah. What I uh, would like to do uh, after we come back is uh, show some photos uh, yeah. from the book yeah. and talk about the uh, two reissues of the albums. You're Anything taking else a break already? already? Good to okay. see you. Yeah. We'll be right back with Jimmy Page. Mm -hmm. That was only two minutes. <laughs> that was uh, The Temptations. Girl, I'm losing you. Temptations. All right, here we go. You tell me what's going on here, who's involved, and uh, if necessary, the ages. Okay. So, okay, so this is around the age of about 13 or 14. 13, let's say. And uh, 14, 14. And this guy over here is the guy who shows me the first guitar chords. And... This is what you could almost call like a skiffle group or groupette. And I, I've heard the, the term skiffle yeah, band. Yeah. I have no idea what that is. Okay, well, listen, what, it, what it was was that uh, everyone could be able to strum a few chords and you could get away with three chords, really. With, everyone's heard about this three-chord mm -hmm. trick. And then uh, the, the skiffle groups were playing the music of Lead Belly, Woody Guthrie, and that. And it was like a sort of community sing-song, mm -hmm. really. Early, early American yeah, music. It's all baby. American, yeah. What kind of guitar is that? That's that, a beautiful guitar. That's a Hoffner guitar made in Germany. That's the sort of first guitar that I got after, a, like, the campfire guitar. But, 
Yeah. A, a, a guitar, you sort of inherited a guitar at a yeah, home that your folks moved into. Yes, I know. It's weird, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And then you were you took to the guitar and learned to, to play the yeah. Guitar yeah, bit by bit I got the connection with the, what was going on on the television with rock and roll music and nice. this guitar. Okay. Here's a kid that's getting all the chicks right here. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I... <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. I, I definitely had a lifestyle at this point, but okay, so here's, here's my record collection, uh -huh. and actually, in this photograph, this, there's a gold disc which is for Led Zeppelin, however, this is the room where I actually He's routine here, Led right? Zeppelin, put them together, That's if the you best. like, you know, from the first rehearsal uh, in London, I got them out of my house in the countryside, and we rehearsed all of the first album before we cut it, and the set that we go on the road with, and this is the same room that... Uh, whole lot of love gets routined in, and wow. uh, yeah, what is my wow. favorite <laughs> So this here is it in is. in Chicago. Here yeah. we are, you and your buddies at work. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> so that's... So this is, this is like 1969, and by that time we were really working so much. I think we must have worked up to about six months in 1969 just in America mm. because, uh, you know, we were just trying to play as many places as we could. And you can see from this, it's a really healthy crowd, you know? <laughs> so. so those were the remote. days, boy, 1969. Uh, that was the thick of it, my friend, sure. wasn't it? Yeah. And here we go. Oh, Mr. Superstar. Look at this. Wow, yeah. 1975. Yeah. 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 Great shot. You see, the interesting thing about this, you know, it's quite iconic, this with the dragon suit and the double neck, I know. But the double neck comes as a result of recording the song Stairway to Heaven. And, uh, oh, thank you, thanks. And on, on, on Stairway, there's an acoustic guitar and a six-string lead break and uh, 12 string uh, overdubs and all of that. So many guitars on it. So I thought the only way to be able to do it, because we had to do it live, was get this double neck guitar, and uh, well, that's the story behind now, it. Uh, 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 that's a great shot. Were they, were they easy to get a hold of then? Did you have to have it special made, or did they exist before? Yeah. Well, what, way to have I'd seen, I'd seen uh, double neck guitars in country and western music, mm. you know, like Grady Martin and people like that mm -hmm. had them. Um, but this, this. Uh, Gibson had made something like this, but this was this was made for me at the time. That's remarkable. You, you say the the lower neck that's uh, six string, six string yeah. and the upper is twelve string. Yeah, twelve yeah. string guitar, uh, difficult to play, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> the only thing is, I'll be very honest with you, I could never play both necks at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, by God, then you'd have had a career. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Les Paul could have done it. Les Paul could have done it. Now this is 1977, and again, ladies and gentlemen, take a look at this. Right. That's all you need to know. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Swag. That's fantastic. And well, that was yeah. taken in, uh, where was that? That's in the uh, first uh, leg of the U.S. tour in 1977. He's got it on you stage and off stage. Uh, I don't know, it might be Orlando, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure where that is. You may not have even known that. Not up by hand. <laughs> it, looks, it looks suspiciously like I may not have done. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, you know, it's, it's, it's cloaked with attitude, shall not we say that? <laughs> well... <laughs> The, the cake, you, the cake this, of attitude. Uh, this, this book is uh, delightful. You can, you can spend uh, five minutes with it, you can spend an hour and a half with it, and it's very, very satisfying. And the chronology of it and uh, watching people you know and people you grew with uh, musically is fascinating. Yeah. A lovely collection. And uh, you have the two uh, reissues coming out. Yes, indeed, yeah. Yeah, uh, with, with the uh, Led Zeppelin re-releases, of which there's been three already, and the, the, the response to them has been fantastic, and well, I really want to thank the fans for that, because it's only better, thank you. Thanks. But we, 
We're, we're at the point now where Led Zeppelin 4 is coming out and Houses of the Holy, and they've got the companion discs like the early ones did, and there's different versions of Stairway to Heaven and a uh, uh, very interesting mix of Stairway to Heaven. It's like an audio file one. It's very interesting. I did a cut of Stairway to Heaven. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, I, I, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you again. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Jimmy Page, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back with Mom. Hey, everybody. Right up. Well, they got a decent amount of airtime. Okay, so this is the radio here. I'll never forget the first time I heard Led Zeppelin fall. I was probably too young to understand the intricacy of the music, but it kind of set a tone for the rest of my life to the standard of music that I was constantly looking for and aspiring towards when I was finding new albums. There is something so special about that music because not only is it intricate, it can spark emotions in a person of any age. I'm Sophie Kay. We'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of one of the greatest selling, best loved and most influential records of all time. This is Led Zeppelin IV. Following their first three critically acclaimed albums, an intense touring schedule and an ever moving musical landscape, Led Zeppelin rose to the task of creating their most ambitious album yet. With Robert Plant delivering iconic vocals, Jimmy Page's guitar and production prowess, John Paul Jones, the ever-reliable multi-instrumentalist, and the inimitable John Bonham behind drums, Led Zeppelin's untitled fourth album released on 8th of November 1971 became an instant classic. It is a hard rock album like no other. Here's Jimmy Page again. It seriously covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does, because it's got Black Dog, which is a killer riff, kicking it off with this sort of call and response, you know, Robert's vocal and then the response to the riff, etc. And then you've got, like, Levy Breaks, as you quite say, which is a, on the vinyl, that would be the, the last track on side two, but, you know, if it's CD format, it's the last track. That that is so dense and it's so, it's so menacing that, and it's fantastic because that's it, you know, yeah, you created so something which is really quite amazing and ground-changing on, on every level, you know, with recording techniques and everything. But also, within that album, there's the sensitive moments of really caressing the vocals of, uh, of Robert on Going to California, and you've got this really intimate aspect, and that, that was literally recorded in the uh, living room there, just round the fire, you know. That and, and Battle of Evermore, you know, that, that kicks off there with the, with the mandolin. And you've got the sort of what people would say, like, they're sort of folk, well, are they? But, you know, maybe they're not. But, oh, maybe they are. But this, this whole aspect of the intimate aspect of those two songs in particular, but especially, especially going to California. And then you've got the real sort of muscle, if you like, of something like Misty Mountain Hop. And rock and roll is one which comes out of thin air. If rock and roll demonstrates the band at their hard rocking best, the third track, The Battle of Evermore, fit with mandolin, Tolkien references, and a duet between Plant and Sandy Denny, displays the band's folkier side, their interest in mythology and mysticism, as well as their willingness to experiment. Well, John Paul Jones brought a mandolin along. We hadn't actually been used up to that point and it was sitting on the piano and when John Paul Jones wasn't around at this point and I sort of I was curious I kept seeing this thing on the piano and I hadn't played mandolin before so I didn't tune into guitar so I thought I wonder how this works and I just started playing it and getting something out of it hmm. and before I knew where I was like I'd got the whole of the sequence of, of Battle of Evermore together now, all I can say about that, it was just, this whole period was a really inspired period. I mean, a, you wouldn't expect something like that to just come out of, you know, just chance, chance encounter the creative with an instrument, you know. The creative I mean, the I think we were all collectively massive Fairport Convention fans. I mean, I know John Bonham really liked, he listened to them because he really liked Dave Maddox. 
and he knew Peggy from from there as well. Dave Peg, you know, they were sort of mates from there, from Birmingham. Um, I I'd re I'd listened to Fairport uh, right right from the very first album, and I just loved. Well, I love the work they did, and her voice was just extraordinary. Robert made the suggestion that he really liked to do this with Sandy Denny, and I said, "Well, let's try and get her." And, and she came in to not to Headley, but she came into Island Studios and put the vocals on there. Yeah, Robert had a pretty good idea of what he wanted to do on that, you know, with his vocals, his vocals, and have her singularly coming in. You know, I played acoustic guitar at home. And certainly during the time of the Yardbirds and during the time of Led Zeppelin, I would play acoustic guitar at home. I didn't come off a tour and set up a big <laughs> amp system and play her away. I'd play acoustic guitar. And so I worked out a lot. And I'd had this, what we'll call the introduction of it. I had various sections that I wanted to sort of amalgamate, glue together, to be able to have a piece of music that, that actually would gain in momentum as it went through there there would be layers that would be unfolded but it would keep moving so that the tempo from the the fragile guitar that starts it off by the end is two totally different things but, i mean i used to play um a little bit of classical guitar things like the bure by bark were the sort of things that you know i was playing and i mean stairways in that sort of vein with the track Levy Breaks is a good example. I wanted to do backwards guitar on it and various things with the recording of the harmonica and one thing and another. And we managed to do all of that there. The only problem that I foresaw with Stairway was with, with having so much fun and moving the, you know, getting the drums to actually sort of now take it all back and have something that was quite restrained. I thought, I know how to deal with this. We'll actually do it in a big studio in uh, London we went into Ireland studios to record Stairway because it needed it needed a lot of eye contact and you know it was really it was tricky mm. well it's supposed to pace that the way that the thing keeps unfolding I knew how I was going to start the solo the first few notes and I knew how it was going to end so I wanted like this sort of hysterical trill to go into the last section really not hysterical it was like a hysteria you mm. know and yeah, it was really reflective of of uh, it was, it's reflective of a lot of things, isn't it? The solo, but but yeah. it really works in yeah. context. The build of it, the construction of that solo is pretty pretty good. It holds up. I mean, even to me, and I'm a real I know, I'm really not a fan. One of, of the, the only song. tracks not, not recorded at the now infamous country house Headley Grange. Here's Jimmy Page. Yeah, I think we've gone into the studio, uh, Olympic, and done a couple of things. We'd done a version of When the Levy Breaks, quite different to the, uh, the version that everybody knows. Yeah, that was done earlier. That was done probably at the end of 1970. But we really needed to find somewhere to sort of get in and start working, rehearsing and that. And this, this house came, well, to my attention anyway, and it was, it was called Headley Grange. It was in Hampshire, and it had had other bands that had rehearsed there well at least i know that uh, fleetwood mac had rehearsed there and it was also a residence as well if you wanted to stay there and i thought that it would be a really really sound idea to take on the work ethic of the whole band going into this place with a recording truck and just everyone needed to make an, a commitment you know to uh, sort of basically eat there, sleep there, and then just make music. That's what was going to happen. That was awesome. And that, in effect, is what we did. That's what I did, elected yeah. to have the worst room, which was at the top of the house, and it was a bit damp and all of that, but I didn't care. I didn't... The most important thing was to get everybody in there Go and, and, and subscribing to this, this idea. And it was really, really sound, and it was so productive, and it was so inspired, this whole period that we were there on the first occasion which is in effect the fourth album well you see the thing is that within the chemistry or the alchemy of Led Zeppelin every time we we do a say a sound check at a gig or whatever we'd just be sort of jamming and playing and when we were playing live the numbers would change and they'd mutate and you know sometimes they get longer sometimes they get shorter but every night's concert was subtly or sometimes quite dramatically different and so it wasn't too difficult to make two and two equal four, album four, because 
we knew we had it in us, but to be given this sort of facility, providing you didn't get something, didn't shut it down, like uh, neighbour problems, and of course, as other bands had rehearsed, you, you had a good chance that you could do it, and we did manage to, without any sort of complaints from local residents or whatever. Given this uh, opportunity, then the sort of basic the world was our oyster or, or rock lobster. Released on November 8, 1971, in an incredible year for music that saw the releases of classics like The Who's Who's Next, The Stone's Sticky Fingers, Bowie's Hunky Dory, Jethro Tull's Aqualung, The Doors' L.A. Woman, T-Rex Electric Warrior, Sabbath's Master of Reality, The Yes Album, and so oh, many more. It was a sign that the music man. scene was changing quickly. Here's Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page. Sure, we were aware of what was going on around us, but the one of the things that just helped the whole situation of Led Zeppelin and the fact that each time we arrived at the point of recording a new album, we could just keep pushing ourselves and pushing musical boundaries and the, the landscape and over the distance of the, the furthest peaks and hills that you could see and mountains, you could, you could do this and you could go to the highest heights and the deepest, intense, dense areas as well you know you could do you could do all of this because you weren't caught up in doing the singles so it gave you the opportunity to really be put all your creative juices of all four of us into something so we could break all manner you know we could yeah. break the rules and we'd already broken the rules in in so many different areas anyway musically but it was a challenge and a good good healthy challenge it wasn't it was always exciting to go in to do a recording Led Zeppelin 4 is the perfect I'm example sure of the band's musical dexterity and it shows off the intricacy of their music. Some of the success of the records that have lasted, like this one, can be put down to happy accidents and also an artist's courage to experiment. And that is certainly the case on this album, as the band tried things out while at Headley Grange. Well, what happens on 4 is that we have this sort of recording in Headley and we're experimenting because it's the first time we go in so as I say there's things which are done in the, the living room there and the, like rock and roll the drum kit is still in the, the main room there and we're experimenting to the point where a drum kit gets set up in the hallway and the hallway is the hallway in a country house large country house that it is and it's got sort of staircases going up to two floors it's all wood and the reflective surfaces are just incredible you know and and so we were experimenting and that's levy breaks and misty mountain hop is recorded with the drums in the hall as well so all the time there's this sort of uh, experimenting going on at the time it was being worked on as like from analog and uh, to mm. to vinyl and so you'd have one side of vinyl then you turn it over i was keen to have one of the uh, acoustic tracks on one mm. side and one on the other and then ending up with each one having quite an epic, so one, one side would end with stairway and the other with levee brakes. It, it seemed like a natural process to what, what, what it was going to be. Purely by the placement of the songs, it, it brings more power to the one that follows each time. The reviewers of the time could only have a point of reference. They were so used to bands that did singles, and there was, there was some, there's a conduit between one album and the current album, maybe, that they're yeah. having to... To review because the singles made it a comfort zone to be able to review stuff. People people found it very difficult to review Led Zeppelin albums at the time, so they couldn't really work out what it was all about, why each album was sounding so different to the, the next. And there would be there would be criticism no matter what. So because they didn't have this point of reference of singles, well, that's just too bad. Because for us it was, you know, it was right from the beginning. I didn't want to do. Get, I didn't want to get caught, wow. caught up in the Critics singles really market. Didn't like them. And that gives you the license to be able to just Incredible. expand what you're doing and keep expanding without having to have it drawn back into, oh, but where's the single? Now, See, isn't they the couldn't be controlled. The penultimate track on Led Zeppelin's fourth album, Going to California. And the record boasts one of the greatest closing tracks on any album ever. A hypnotic cover of Kansas Joe McCoy and Memphis Minnie's 1929 country blues song, it could soundtrack the end of the world. And that's largely thanks to the colossal sound of John Bonham's drums. John Bonham was an extraordinary drummer, as we all know. Across this. So the first thing that I'd like to establish about John Bonham's playing was that it was all done with the wrists. 
um, and he knew how to tune his drums as a science. So when he hit the drum, it would really project out of it because he knew how to tune the skin so that it would do that. It's an acoustic instrument, and he knew how to make it really it as big as possible. I mean, he wanted his drums to sound really big. So, yeah, okay, you know, that, that, was, uh, that, that was his massive technique, really. He had a second drum kit that was set up in the, uh, uh, while we were doing something else. We were recording, I think, and uh, the drum kit was set up, and he just went out there and started playing the drums, and it was, like, immense. And it was, it was like, oh, this is, we could try that number that we tried before that didn't work out. The whole prospect of recording the drums in the hall which sort of manifests on um, when the levee breaks was something that I could already hear that in my head, you know, going in and I was thinking, well, this, I've got this really uh, interesting concept of a riff, which is something that goes That's round and round, and then you can have, like, an intervention over the, this whole thing. We just played it over and over, like, it's a little trance. What Led Zeppelin was about, it was about performance. Whether it was live on stage, or in the studio, and if you had a song, and the character of that song was which it shaped, and you wanted to make sure that you got the particular sort of energy, if you want, the connection of that energy is captured on the tape. So each song has its own sort of character, its own attitude, its own intensity, or its own sensitivity. It's really important to do that, but because it was performance, and capturing performance, and because it's live playing, and it's not you know, or sort of put together with a computer or whatever. People like the honesty of that and the fact that you've got, with, with Led Zeppelin music, I mean, you can hear it, but if you listen to it, you can hear just how complex it is. It's, it's running at counterpoint. In whatever position it was in, whether it was, it was touring live or whether, whether it was writing for the band or performing in the band or producing the band, I mean, I just was really making sure that what I was doing was the best that I could possibly muster up in myself at any given time. Led Zeppelin IV is an album that success is difficult to comprehend even now. Over 37 million copies have been sold worldwide. It's an essential part of any music fan's vinyl collection. To me, that was a time in history where genres like rock and prog really, really were at the top of that popular mainstream culture. And those are genres where you can't fake it. You can't just get a songwriter to write some catchy hooks and then the song becomes massive. This has to come up from a place of authenticity. And Led Zeppelin IV just personified that. It's amazing songwriting. The talent behind it is unbelievable. Everything about it was so beautifully crafted that inevitably it lives on throughout time because if you're a music fan, it doesn't matter which era the music's coming from, you just appreciate innovative, well-crafted music. I'm Sophie Kay, and thank you for joining me to celebrate Led Zeppelin IV in a year that it turned 50. Good night. Why not? That was really Thank you good. for tuning in, and please hit that like button, it's appreciated. Yeah, it Make sure Thanks that you subscribe for more rock-related content. Right on. Okay, this is a page solo. One of your favorites, Mary. This is from a This is where Eddie Van Halen got his famous uh, plucking style from. I believe this is the song.
This is the Bach part that, uh, that we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, uh, Murray, you're right, man. That is a great, great guitar solo. I like the little bark piece in there. And that little jig where everyone was clapping. Well, that crowd was a touch on the lame side. They should have been clapping harder. <clears throat> All the same, yeah, excellent, excellent solo. It's got so many different ins and outs about it so many different characters all merged in one and all of that swag this guy's got <laughs> it's the spirit of his delivery it's a swag it's all of that sort of thing that makes this guy my favorite guitarist and my favorite musician happy birthday to you jimmy page so let's do this man uh actually you know what i'm curious as hell uh let's uh let's scroll down and read some of these comments it'll be interesting my one regret in life is that I was born too late to see Zeppelin live in their prime. Yeah, he's got like uh, thousands of thumbs up on that one and 73 replies. I speak as a musician. Back in those days, this was like God playing guitar, not only for his ability, but the whole emotion on each note spirit of its delivery. Today I get easily bored by perfect solos without phrasing and dynamics like this. Bless Jimmy Page forever. Yeah, okay, that really blew up some serious uh, replies there. 124 replies to this comment. You could actually break this solo down into riffs and make a whole hit album with it. I was born and raised on rap and R&B, like me. And even I can appreciate the talent of Mr. Jimmy Page. It amazes me how he did what he did. I swear I got goosebumps. His best solo has always been Since I've Been Loving You. Since I've Been Loving You is my favorite song. Uh, his uh, guitar solo from that is definitely up there in my top five if I have one. But uh, yeah, man, I uh, really dig the solo work that he did on uh, Dazed and Confused 73. That shit with the bow, and oh man, I'm telling you. The sound he gets out of that Les Paul is just unbelievable. I don't think, I don't know if it's reworked or what it, 
if it's just so unique, and his playing is insane, always was. Jimmy Page is a god, but I might argue about this being his best solo. There's a few dazed and confused solos I like. Uh, I might put up against this one. Right, right. This lady and I are on the same page. Um, at the three minute mark, my man just went from playing a blues riff to playing Bach to playing like a maniac all in less than a minute. There you go, man. Jimmy Page is up there with the greatest guitarists in history, and that's just facts. Jimmy's solos are the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> I love how those I love how, how those who will never achieve this level are the critics of Jimmy Page. Yeah, man. I'm thinking of Rolling Stone. I'm also thinking of another putz from uh, the Village Voice. Oh. Anyway, I don't want to go into a rant state. Let's read one more. I am happy that I was born in this generation. I can listen to Led Zeppelin anytime and watch footage for free. It's all there, and that's what I appreciate. Yeah, it sucks that I will never see this band live, but I can always see them in their prime here. Right on. That's it. Perfect. Very well said. So, that's the praise of the man. So, let's go on to a little bit of structure and officially introduce the man. For a lot of my subscribers, and thank you, by the way, letting me know who you are. Um, some of them are very young. Some of them come from an R&B background like myself. Uh, some of them just aren't very, very aware of who Jimmy Page is and what his uh, influence is and that sort of thing. So let me give you a super, super brief summary of what the man is, and I can't read his entire bio. Jimmy Page. James Patrick Page, OBE, Order of the British Empire, born the 9th of January, 1944, is an English musician, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and record producer who achieved international success as the guitarist and founder of the rock band Led Zeppelin. Page is prolific in creating guitar riffs, and his varied style involves various alternate guitar tunings, technical and melodic solos, coupled with aggressive, distorted guitar tones, as well as his folk and Eastern influence acoustic work. He is also noted for occasionally playing his guitar with a cello bow to create a droning sound texture to the music. Page is widely considered to be one of the greatest and most influential guitarists of all time. Rolling Stone has described Page as the Pontiff of Power Riffing and ranked him number three in their list of the 100 greatest guitarists of all time, behind Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton. In 2010, he was ranked number two in Gibson's list of the top 50 guitarists of all time, and in 2007, number four on Classics Rock's 100 Wildest Guitar Heroes. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice, once as a member of the Yardbirds in 92, and once as a member of Led Zeppelin in 95. And that's the man. That's the man, Jimmy Page. When gods walked among us, talent on loan from God, and all of these other different things that I used to describe the, describe the guy, are really fantastic. And um, and for I'm still addressing a lot of people who don't know who this guy is, or who's young or new to my channel. This dude, man, and his band Led Zeppelin. Uh, right now, uh, one of his bandmates, John Paul Jones, is my artist of the month for January. These guys collectively have contributed to um, easily half the subscribers on my classic rock channel. Easily. And uh, here's the thing. When I started my channel into the, I think, two-month mark, I did a reaction called um, Since I've Been Loving You, one of the songs. And immediately, uh, a couple of days after that, my subscription rate doubled. And in uh, six months, I went from 1,500 subscribers to 10,000, right? Uh, man, so I'm telling you, half of 
Uh, yeah, I would say half of my subscriber success and the success of this channel and the longevity of it and all of that is coming by way of the works and the contributions of Led Zeppelin to my channel. I'm not going to front at all. I was at one point in time even thinking of just doing a separate Led Zeppelin channel, you know, just to keep things different. And um, I, I don't know, I might still do that because overall, I'm guessing off the top of my head, I've done probably, uh, I know I've done over 200 Led Zeppelin reactions and it doesn't seem that it's going to end. So by the time I stop doing reactions or whatever it is, I can see myself being in the area of about three, 350, maybe even 400 Led Zeppelin reactions collectively. So in doing so, I might consider actually splitting off and taking all the Led Zeppelin content from the channel and putting it into its own uh, channel folder. You know what I mean? I might do that. Let me know. Give me some feedback about that if you think I should go this route because obviously uh, my Led Zeppelin journey isn't over. I Confession time. This is the most embarrassing thing I think I have to admit to. Uh, besides not knowing classic rock as well as I should have and I'm still finding a lot of green spots sometimes. My most embarrassing thing about classic rock is uh, my assumption about Led Zeppelin when I started. I said, okay, you know, they got Black Dog and Stairway to Heaven and Rock and Roll and uh, Immigrant Song. Good band, good band, good sounding band, good looking band. I'll definitely give them their due, you know, a couple of quads and then I'll move on. That was me. That was my attitude, right? That was my whole, you know, when I started. And then uh, since uh, I've Been Loving You came along and then I'm like, holy shit. And then a lot of the people realized that, I, okay, this guy's really green about this. Let's send him some stuff. And so then started sending me some things and I realized, damn, man, these guys are covering some serious blues, some stuff going way the hell back connected me to my dad, stuff that my dad had, some of these old ass tracks my dad and his best friend, Old Man Rufus, used to listen to and play and they'd smoke their nasty cigars and they'd be listening to this shit and it started triggering my memories. I'm like, oh my gosh, man, these guys, the Lemon Song that they did, I remember passages. They must have covered, my dad says too, they must have covered about 13 different blues and soul sources in one song so it got my attention hard and so uh as i kept doing more reactions i realized that they also had a great folk background and uh that really appeals to my dad because you know he's um i think uh got every single thing dylan and uh grateful dead so it was a big deal and then after that, I went on and I realized that they did some what I call fantasy, far and away kind of songs like uh, No Quarter, for example, and Achilles' Last Stand. And so um, I had to admit to everybody, and it's always embarrassing, I had to admit that, holy shit, you know what? I only know like maybe a minute part about these guys. So, you know, this is about maybe six or seven songs in and the rain song blew my mind because I also had an attitude about ballads. I couldn't tell you the difference between ballads and love songs. I just knew that I just don't like love songs. I don't like, I just don't like love songs. And I said, I'm not going to be turning my beautiful classic rock channel into some damn circus with sappy ass love songs that was that was my attitude and i didn't know what a ballad was compared to a love song right in my mind a love song is some sappy ass shit sang by a bunch of teenage girls right and uh there's just no way that i was going to entertain sappy ass love songs on my channel and so someone sent me the rain song and i knew the difference between uh, a ballad and a sappy ass love song. So anyway, I decided that, okay, I'm not going to be ignorant about these guys anymore because it was my greatest amount of ignorance. When you're talking about super groups, for example, you know, you got your Led Zeppelin, Stones, Beatles, who I knew more about the other three than this uh, band. And so I decided, okay, let's get to know these guys. 
I went all the way back from the very, very beginning, started with the very first song, and I said, I'm going to comb through this shit like a fine tooth comb, and I'm not going to miss a single thing. I'm going to turn it into a science. I owe it to these guys because, like I said, I know more about the other three. Um, I have a I have a top four, if you're wondering. Uh, those four bands, to me, are the biggest, right? And Led Zeppelin, I knew the least amount of. So that's why I decided to, as now I call it, give it the Led Zeppelin treatment. It's a magnifying glass of focus. And when I get locked into that, you better not interrupt me. You better not get in my way because I'm on a mission. And so my friend said, holy shit, man, you just went from doing uh, one or two reactions a week to like five or six we would leave in the morning, we would come back in the afternoon and the evening, and you're still sitting here doing reactions eight hours later. Holy cow. So, but it was for the better because before I was putting that same kind of energy into anti-war stuff, and I didn't realize that it was opening previous service wounds. And so changing that focus to a Led Zeppelin focus and turning that into a science of study was really, really cool. And then, of course, I started to see the uh, reactions from a lot of other people about, okay, yeah, man, this guy is really getting into the Led Zeppelin groove. I dig it. And so Led Zeppelin, before I knew it, completely inundated my channel, which is a good thing and which is a bad thing. Uh, on my Beyond Classic Rock channel, I uh, made the solemn vow not to allow any one particular act inundate and take over the platform as much as Led Zeppelin has on this one. So there's pros and cons, there's good and bad, there's balance, right? Anyway, that is my personal testimony of Led Zeppelin. That is my personal testimony of how these uh, incredible artists came together and I, I really appreciate what they've given to me and given to my channel and also given to uh, the fan base on the world. 500 years from now, we're still going to be talking about these great guys. You know, long after we're all gone, they're still going to be fans of Led Zeppelin and that incredible uh, signature sound, that soul-grabbing, soul-haunting sound that these guys can create. And at the heart of it all is this very, very nice, mild, meek-mannered man, Jimmy Page. But damn, you put a guitar in his hands and then you uh, put some elements behind him in the form of bandmates and it's incredible what he was able to create. What an incredible career, right? I remember answering this question. One of my friends was saying to me, hey, if you had a chance to come back uh, in life and repeat your life, who would you choose to be? And immediately I said, uh, Jimmy Page, right? Number one. Could you imagine? I said Jimmy Page. And that's when I knew that the dude was my favorite musician. And uh, then I thought about it. Well, no, probably Hugh Hefner first, then Jimmy Page. But you know what I'm trying to say, right? That is the amount of um, uh, appreciation I have for the lad. So, uh, happy birthday to you, Mr. Jimmy Page. So, going forward... Um, and also to another great member of Led Zeppelin, John Paul Jones. I've got some Jonesy stuff uh, coming up. Is it today? Or no, it's tomorrow. And then um, I've got other reactions I've got to do. Uh, Jeffrey, Susan, Pete, Jennifer. got reactions i got to do for you folks. <clears throat> I'm forgetting something now. I can't remember what I was going to say. Uh... But it's in reference to what's coming up on the channel. So that's what's happening on the channel. I'm really enjoying Jonesy Month. I really haven't uh, really gotten into the groove of it yet. So I'm looking forward to hitting up a couple of more reactions. And I'm going to be hitting them fast. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. The Led Zeppelin Factor is going to completely haunt and inundate this channel for the month of January. So if you are not a Led Zeppelin fan, and if you're not inclined to seeing a lot of Led Zeppelin stuff from me, I really advise you to pass this month by, because every other day you're going to get some Led Zeppelin in your ass, right? So, for example, what am I saying? In the last uh, four weeks, 
a lot of Led Zeppelin content that's on YouTube uh, has been blocked. And all of a sudden, it's become unblocked. And I can't explain why that is. But what I've been doing is I've been uh, every other day or so <clears throat> uh, publishing it because I have a feeling that there's a tick in time there and that it's going to be unavailable. Sometimes it's unblocked and then it's blocked again. So I've been publishing them. So uh, a lot of people who haven't seen it before um, will get a chance to see it before it gets blocked again. So that's what's ha happening. That's why you're getting so much Led Zeppelin content for the month of January. And then I think that door is going to close and then it's just going to go back to normal. Maybe a typical one Led Zeppelin reaction uh, of sorts per week. You know what I mean? But for the month of January, that's why you're going to be getting so much Led Zeppelin content. And again, a warning, if you come into my platform and write some stupid shit about no oh, too much Led Zeppelin or anything like that, yo, I'm going to just get into your face real hard because you've been warned many times already. And before you say something that dumb, look at my playlist between this platform, um, that what's on my public Patreon and what's on my Vimeo page and count. You will see that I've done well over 600 reactions. So there's a lot out there for everybody so if you start saying dumb shit like oh man do something different do a little bit more mix it up a little bit yo i've been mixing it up like a mother right so go and check out my other uh areas you're gonna have hundreds and i say it with a capital h hundreds of choices okay so this month it's basically led zeppelin month you know uh they've never been artist of the month but um, it's the closest with Jonesy and then all of the content that I'm publishing, plus Jimmy Page's birthday. So there you go. This is pretty much Led Zeppelin month. All right. Um, what else was I going to say? I think that's it. That's it. I'm done, man. I talked long enough. So thank you very much. Happy birthday, Jimmy Page. Hope you uh, have many, many more wonderful birthdays and that you live as long as Betty White did. Rest in peace, Betty White. You're a beautiful lady, and I know that you're uh, somewhere entertaining people and being happy. All right. So, y'all, I'm going to bounce. Thanks all of you who uh, sent me these uh, recommendations, man. Susan, um, uh, Evelyn, Tina, and Murray. I appreciate it very much. This was excellent, watching this string of stuff featuring Jimmy Page. Have a good one. Take care, and I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.